الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. أحب أن تسير مرة أخرى إلى السيسترز في هذا السمستر القادم. والتوبيك هو الرجال والمجالات المجالات المجالات. أحب أن أبدأ مع هذا الفرس الفرسي الفرس في الذي يقول فهو إذا من الأسف التي تنظر It burns and blazes with inward fire only when it escapes from the shackles of East and West. <clears throat> so, a part is trying to teach us a very important lesson here about the universality of moral principles. So, we want to teach the Eastern man, which he used East for the Eastern poor, basically. That yes, the sun rises from the east, but that's not enough. I mean, don't be self-centered. You need to free yourself from both eastern and western identity. Just be a human, be a universal human being. Uh, so. Uh, This problem I faced uh, in a nice way. A few years ago, I was attending a conference in Pennsylvania, and uh, an American friend of mine said something nice, uh, but very revealing. <coughs> He said that uh, many people in the Islamic world think that America doesn't believe in human rights, but they are wrong. America believes in human rights indeed. The problem is the American definition of human. So it's not about you believe in principles. The problem is, are we ready to apply these principles everywhere for everybody? And of course, this is not an American problem. This is a problem of all cultures, all civilizations. Are we ready to treat others as a human? Are we ready to go beyond these borders? borders of our identity, whether they are religious, ethnic, or national, and to be more uh, humanistic and universalist in our moral view. <coughs> so what, what my friend meant is that American moral standards are not universal, but we'll see that it, this is not only an American problem, it's also our problem, it's everybody, everybody. Uh, Uh, so, let's start with these challenging uh, questions or situation. For example, there is a fight at your child's school, and you come uh, home to face, to save first. You try to face, to save your child first, or other children, or other human beings, or children facing uh, burning a life. So, which one you will start with? Your child? Yes. Or any child you can save in this school? Go ahead. What? The first child you find. The first one? The first child you find. Mm. You sure you want, uh, you want to have advice to look for your child more than others? Of course, we can look for our child, but we, we can also look for... Uh, which one first? If you have to pick, I think comes with You know, for example, you know the classrooms. Let me. I don't think anyone can answer because it comes with reflex. Yeah. It comes with what? Yes. I agree. Well, but we have to think rationally about our decisions. Okay. Okay. Let me let me explain. Let me explain more. You know, you know exactly the classrooms. You know that your child is in class A2, for example, and there are other classrooms. And you have access to all. Which classroom you will go first? Yes? Uh, I think I will first check where is it high. Yes. It's not in A2. <laughs> it's okay, my child is safe, or the, the child is safe. I think the first reflex is how is the damage, or where, where is how big is the problem. Or the well, there is no time to assess the damage. Yeah. It's life and death situation. You don't think well, rationally. In the case of emergency. Okay, let's think about situationally now. What? 
what this person is supposed to do in the future. He will, he will go and then look for his son and then they, uh, the first thing to look at is to save his son. How come he can always stand when the other people are burning? Yes, sure, sure, sure I, I'm looking for my child first. This is sure. I think okay. This is sure. So, okay, let's go to the next question. It's more, more challenging. What about if you are a firefighter, right? On duty. You are a firefighter. Does this change uh, the situation? Your child is there, but you are also a firefighter. So, which one you start with in this case? Any children. Any child. Why? Because this is your children. Can you ignore your child burning the wife and just to do your job? <laughs> your child first? Okay, being parents is more important than being firefighter. What else? Any other answers? Yeah, I will try to bring uh, uh, the we to my child uh, and on the we saving the others. <laughs> <laughs> That's a political way to say it, okay. <laughs> Human life is a life. It's a sacred life at the end of the day. Okay, no distinction. No, no distinction. Mm. Let's look at another situation. There is an earthquake. You have some earthquake victim and living in your in the living room of your small apartment. Well, there are your guests. The Prophet said they have to tell that, that you know you have to honor this for three days, but they might need to stay there for three years. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, very disturbing for your family. The apartment is very small. So what you're gonna do in this case? First to accept them and then to find solution. <laughs> no, you, you are already accepting them. The yeah. problem is that if you don't know when they will be able to get out, it just might take years. <laughs> you're paying the rent, you can't see, it's noisy, <laughs> they're crowded. So we can find solution together and find another solution than our mm. apartment. They can buy groceries. What? They can buy groceries. <laughs> okay, what else? Okay. The third case is you have victims of civil wars on the border of your country. Um, like people are dying now in the Mediterranean trying to come here to this country or to France or to any other country, for example. Um, but you said, okay, if I accept them, if I accept 3,000 today, 3 million will come. Mm -hmm. And it's not fair for people who, citizens of this country, who are paying taxes to have the burden of millions of other human beings. So, what are you going to do? This is a, this is a moral challenge. It's like Lampedusa, for example. What? It's like the case of Lampedusa in Italy. Mm -hmm. But they had the same case. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a, this is one of the discussion in Europe today. You know, how far can we help people without putting burden on other people who also they are working hard, they are paying taxes to have this infrastructure for themselves, not for someone else. Yes? But I think to a certain degree that's kind of our responsibility to one another, like especially at a time of war or oppression, you kind of have to do that type of sacrifice because like if we got to the condition where there is a civil war, then we all were responsible in one way or another active and not letting it get that far, so you have to support another and like them the result. Um, so you accept all of them or some of them or you don't accept any of these refugees on board? Am I the one who gets to decide or am I a citizen? Yeah let's let's suppose yeah as a citizen or, or even as a, as a political leader, but you are responsible of your people also. Yeah. And yeah. you want to, you want to, you want to the, the, all of this is, you have a clash between two uh, <laughs> commitments or two moral responsibilities. Your moral responsibility to your child and to other, other human beings, children. Moral responsibility to all those victims of the earthquake, but to your family, also in your apartment. Moral responsibility towards the refugees who are running for their life and, and citizens of your country who are also working hard to live, not, not to, to spend on others 
So this is just this is just an example. Let's think about it for this moral challenge that is called borders of a moral uh, community. So what is uh, it's not <coughs> from here? Yeah. Okay. So what is moral community? A moral community, according to William Spahn, is a professor of theological ethics from California. Moral community refers to the network of those to whom we recognize as ethical, uh, sorry, to whom we recognize an ethical connection through the demands of justice, the bonds of compassion, or a sense of obligation. Now, those of you who that we felt ethically, morally connected to through justice, that we need to we need to achieve justice for them through compassion because we have some special connection to them more than to others. They are followers of religion or citizens of our country or our ethnic uh, members of our ethnic group, for example. And we have an obligation toward them more than uh, toward other human beings. This is the concept of borders moral community. <coughs> Okay, so what are these, these the borders? Should these borders be national? So I don't care about anybody who's not citizen of my country, or ethnic. I care only about my ethnic group, or religion. So people are not Muslim, doesn't matter to me, they, they die or live. Or it's all human beings are within the borders of my moral responsibility, or even all living creatures including animals, are also part of my moral responsibility. This is the question. Uh, there, there are a lot of debate between you know, uh, moral philosophers on this. Uh, general philosopher Kant, for example, he has a criterion of rationality. He believes that human beings, because they are rational creatures, have a special dignity that makes them end and other creatures means, so we are the end, our Gaia, and the other creatures are the means, al Wasila. Why? Because we are rational creatures. This is how Kant is defending this. Well, Edgar Moran is, is, uh, doesn't agree on that. Uh, one of his lectures for Kyle in Doha, he, uh, he said that we have to take care of our cousin, the animals, he called them cousins. Yeah. Our cousins, the animals. Why? Because they have emotions and they feel pain and they suffer just like human beings in this sense. So we should not. Dealing with an animal is like dealing with a stone, for example. So we have something in common with animals that make us also have some sense of responsibility. Uh, uh, okay, to put this Challenge into perspective, we need to get an idea on the major moral doctrines today uh, and what kind of character, or the characteristic of each one of these moral doctrines because this is what will help us clarify or think more uh, better about this challenge of moral responsibility. The major moral doctrines today are relativism, subjectivism, utilitarianism, Contractualism, categoricalism, and what, what they call divine command theory. Relativism is people who defend relativism in morality say that different societies have different moralities. So the moral code of every society defines what is right within that specific society. So what is right? For American society, it's not necessarily right for Saudi society or Egyptian or Malaysian or any other society. And they said there is no objective standard or universal truth that can be used to judge if one morality is better than another. <coughs> it's all relative. This is relativism and morality. Subjectivism, relativism is on the level of societies and communities. Subjectivism is on the level of individuals. 
Moral judgment based on subjectivism, moral judgment is based on the individual's feelings, not on reason. It's about feeling, about emotion. So sincerity about one's feeling is the only standard for moral truth. Moral truth is what you feel sincerely that it is right. Moral right, moral wrong is what you feel sincerely is wrong. Like in Hadith, Stifti Qalbaka, ask your heart, for example, in the Hadith. Therefore, but there is no moral right and wrong, actually, in this case, or at least there is no objective standard, again, to use. Utilitarianism saying an action is right if it achieves happiness or pleasure, it's wrong if it causes suffering or pain. So action should be just based on their consequences. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but if it brings good, it's good. If it brings bad, it's bad. So they judge based on results and consequences. Uh, <clears throat> but every person's happiness or pleasure should be taken into account. Uh, where are we? I'm using two hands for two computers. Okay. Contractualism in contractualism, which is a moral theory drawn from the theory of social contract. You know the theory of social contract of John Locke, Hobbes, John Jacques Rousseau. So in this doctrine, the source of morality is the agreement between people on how to deal with one another. But what makes something right is that we agree together that this is where I will treat you, this is where I will treat you. This is right. Uh, so the source of morality is contract. These agreements are morally binding on you as long as others respect them. If they don't respect their side of the contract, you don't have to. So treat people as they treat you. Uh, categoricalism is more principled doctrine. Said an action is right only if it can be universalized without contradiction. This is also Kant, Immanuel Kant theory. He said, an action is right if we, you, you can make it a universal norm. It can be applied to everyone. So, you, you can't lie to others, for example, but you don't like people to lie to you, so this is cannot be right. Uh, you don't, you cannot steal other people's money because you don't like people to steal your money. So any rule, any moral rule that cannot be universalized is not a moral rule. Moral rule is a moral rule, is a, a rule or a norm that can be universalized. Uh, so, in this case, treat people as humans deserve to be treated, not as they treat you. In contractualism, treat people as they treat you. In categories, no, treat people as they deserve to be treated. For example, if someone uh, burns someone alive, and the court want to court issue capital punishment against him, but they don't, they, they won't burn him alive, they just will kill him with gun or something more merciful. So they are not treating him as he treated the victim, but he, they treat him as he deserved to be treated as a human. Says a human deserves to be, if, if, if deserved to be killed, to be killed at least in the most merciful way. Like in the Hadith Prophet if you have to kill, for example, a criminal, a murderer, so do it in the nicest way, most merciful way. And if you have to slaughter an animal, also you have to do it in the nicest and most 
principal uh, way. Categoricalism as a moral doctrine is also based on that we should never use a human being as a means, regardless of the difference, race, religion, gender. There are a lot of practical applications of this, including in bioethics and other issues like abortion and using stem cells, for example, and uh, medical experiments, etc. Et so human being should not be used as a means. Human being is an end, it's not a means. It's not an object. Divine, finally, divine common theory. Uh, in divine common theory, the source of morality is God's command. Something is right because it's commanded by God. You don't need to understand it in your human reason the wisdom behind it, but you believe as a believer that this is right because God wants you to do it. The problem here is in, in moral philosophy, is the action right because God commands it or God commands it because it's right? It is right. Which one? Which one do you think? Is the action right because God wants it? Or God wants this because it's right? This is a very uh, problematic issue because if you say God wants, it, God wants, wants this because it's right means there is a, a higher lower than God's law. If you say uh, it's right because God wants it, also you will say, well, uh, in this case, just it's arbitration. I mean, we don't know the wisdom. There is no criteria, at least a human criteria, to judge if it's right or not. He created the right because I think that makes an action, making right, he created it. So yes, exactly. It's, this is the, the duality of creation and command. al khalq wal amr in Surah Al-A'raf, Al-A'lahu Al-Khalq Wal Amr. To Allah belongs the creation and the command. Actually, the commands of God are compatible with the creation of God. So, He wants you to do the right that He made right, he, in creation, but He wants you to do it also with your free will. Anyway, this is philosophy we don't have time for today. So. If we look at these uh, moral doctrines, what is the what is the place of Islam within these moral doctrines? What is what uh, Dr. Kohl in his uh, his new book, uh, Introduction to Islamic Ethics? What is the logic internal of Islamic ethics, or the internal logic of Islam uh, Islamic ethics? It's clear that Islam, like other religion, the Islamic morality is based on divine command. Because we believe that uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla wants us to do this, so it's right. As long as we are sure 100%, it's, this is what Allah wants for us. But it's more than that. Islamic morality is a combination of category, categoricalism and contractualism. Also. There, are, there are some, uh, in, in, uh, some space of Islamic morality, it's uh, a matter of principle. And it's above all kinds of agreement or, or contract. For example, if 99% of the population voted to kill 1% of the population, well, this is a, it's very democratic. But it's morally wrong. Because you have to have principle above human contractualism. But the human contractualism also is important in other issues that are less, less important. Whatever we agree to, because it's based on the principle of justice. I want to treat you the way you treat me, so in this specific matter, as long as we don't violate one of the major uh, moral principles. So, categoricalism gave some morality, stability, and consistency. <laughs> Contractualism gave flexibility and adaptation. A moral system needs to have stability, and need to have flexibility. If we don't have stability, so people will change everything and they will violate all kinds of sacred principles, including, example I said, if they vote 
90% population were to kill 1% or to drive them out of the country and to deprive them from their nationality, for example. Uh, why this is not acceptable? Because there are some stable moral principles. We have to have some stable moral principles above all kinds of contracts. But we need also flexibility. The moral doctrine, if it's not flexible, you won't be able to, uh, to, uh, to answer our challenges, you know, our changing uh, life. Distinction between the two realms, uh, the, the two realms of um, stability, and stability and flexibility, categoricalism and contractualism, is very important today for any Islamic renewal or revival, uh, we have to distinguish between al-mutlaq, what is absolute, above time and space, above the human contractualism, and what is within this our uh, uh, capacity, moral capacity, uh, that we can change, for example. I mean, we have to distinguish between sharia as a text and fiqh as a human understanding and the human practice colored by the time and space. Okay, now let's go to the, back to the problem of moral community, the world of moral community. There is a very interesting uh, 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 concept about this in Quran, concept of tatfif. In media, they use the term double standard. But I like the, term, the Quranic term of tatfif. And I think it's more accurate and also at least more beautiful for the, those who like classical um, The roots of the human evil is always coming from this tafif. Using double standard in treating the same situation or in treating the same human beings. We read in the verse 1 6, Surat al Mutafifin. Aru Yarm al Shaytan al Rajim, Sunnah al Rahman al Rahim. Wail al Mutafifin. Al Ladina ila Kteru ala Nasi, yes, Tawfun. Wa ila Kaluhum, Aw Wazanuhum, Yusurun. Alaihun ula ika anahum Mabhuthun al Yawm al Rahim. Yawm al Yawm al Nasu, Tarab al Alam. Woe to those that deal in fraud. This is translation which I really don't think it's a good translation but I tried seven different translations of Quran I could not find a satisfying one for the Mokar Fifin Sheikh Shoki might help me in the shall find the right translation if it's not in, in English in Dutch in Dutch Mashallah <laughs> <laughs> he has many languages uh, uh, what do those that deal in fraud those who when they have to receive by measure from men, demand full measure. If, if the right is theirs, they demand full measure. But when they have to give by measure or weight to men, give less than due. If they are the receiver, they are happy to get full right. If they want to give, no. Like we ask other people to respect the human right, and we don't respect, for example. Or we ask them to respect the right of immigrants, and we don't respect the right of immigrants, etc. Uh, and Allah so uh, threatening that this kind of people are very severe punishment. Do they not think that they will be called to account on a tremendous day? The day when all mankind will stand before the Lord of the world. When people stand for the Lord of the world, there is no double standard. <laughs> there is no justice. There is no Okay. There are several uh, verses of the Holy Quran that. Uh, give us uh, something to reflect about on this issue of, of the understanding. For example, a person who has parents, a Muslim has parents who are not Muslims. Uh, not only that, but they are trying to, to turn him away from his religion. They are pushing him, they are pressing him hard, turning him away from his faith. What issues? What, what kind of treatment this person needs to do? Uh, how to deal with his parents. We have uh, here in Surah uh, Man, Allah said, Al-Insan wa Ridahi Husna. 
حملته أمه وهنا على وهن واتصاله في عامين أن أشكر لي ولوالدي ولوالديك إلي المصير أن أشكر لي ولوالديك إلي المصير وإن جاهداك على أن تشرك بما ليس لك به علم فلا تطعهما وصاحبهما في الدنيا معروفا واتبع سبيل من أناد إلي ثم إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون These verses, you know, uh, the translation, as you can read on the screen. And you have enjoined on man to be dutiful and good to his parents. His mother bore him in weakness and hardship, up and weakness and hardship. And his winning is in two years. Show gratitude to me and to your parents. To me is the destiny. But if they strive with you to make you join to worship with me others, that of which you have no knowledge, then obey them not. Yet keep company with them in this world kindly. Follow the path of him who turned to me in repentance and obedience. In the end, the return of you all is to me, and I will tell you the truth and meaning of all that you did. Here you have a clash of moral responsibility. Your duty toward your Creator and your duty toward your Parents, but the parents want to transgress their own limits, and they don't want you to 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 serve Allah Azza wa Jalla and to worship Allah Azza wa Jalla. So that is an order here. In the verse, we have an order: the right of Allah first, and we have also another order: the right of the mother first. And that's why the verse talking about mother, talking about be good to your parents, and then his mother bore him in weakness and hardship. So, as you saying. Don't forget also, the mother is doing for you more than the father did actually. Uh, and the most challenging issue is to be fair with the person who is not fair with you. <laughs> be fair with the unfair. This is most challenging. Be fair with the enemy. Be fair with those who are not fair. And we have this in the Holy Quran. So. يا أيها الذين آمنوا أوفوا بالعقود أو يوفوا بال fulfill all contracts or in other translation fulfill all obligations. Next verse. ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم أن صدوكم عن المسجد الحرام أن تعتدوا. It's not the hatred of some people in once shutting you out of the sacred mosque lead you to transgression and hostility on your part. In the context of the verse is that Muslims were, were driven out of their homes in Mecca. And they were deprived from coming to worship Allah at the sacred mosque. It's open for all. All kinds of pagan uh, tribes in Arabia are welcome to worship and the sacred mosque, except the Muslims. But Allah is telling them, with all of this, do not transmit and that's it. Yes, defend yourself, but don't go beyond that right. وَتَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالْتَقْوَىٰ وَلَتَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالْتَقْوَىٰ If we look at the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have some good example of universalism, Islamic moral universalism. For example, uh, a few hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari, a Jewish boy who used to serve Prophet Salah Islam and Gatsik, and Prophet Salah Islam uh, went to, to visit him. Uh, um, Prophet Salah Islam gave Umar bin Khattab Khullah. Umar sent it as a gift to his brother in Mecca, who was pagan. فَأَهْدَاهَا عُمَرُ لِأَخِينَ لَهُ بِمَكَّةَ كَانَ مُشْتِكًا uh, the Prophet gave his armor to Jewish trader in Medina as a collateral and took from him some barley for his family. Uh, he gave his, his armor collateral, Rahan and Dirahu in the Yahud. Actually, the Prophet died while his armor is still with the Jewish trader in Medina. To fear the Jews, Allah is never with Dirahu, Marhunatun and the Yahudi. 
Joshua man came to me, I saw the law and I narrating. Uh, Joshua woman came to me asking for food, and after helping her, she said to me, May Allah protect you from the punishments in the grave. It's also in Sahih al Bukhari. Uh, Asma bint Abi Bakr al Saddir, uh, she said that my mother came to visit me, her mother was, was pagan at the time, and, uh, she, and she was pagan. I asked Prophet about helping her. Prophet said, honor the kinship ties with your mother. Sili ummaki ya asma, he said. Sili ummaki ya asma. Honor this. Regardless, she's pagan or she's regardless of her, of her faith. And we have also a famous hadith in Bukhari that the funeral passed by and the Prophet Sallallahu stood for it. Someone said, this is Jewish funeral. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, is it not a human soul? So, a human soul? Regardless of faith, so you you need to have some respect for him also, regardless of how they faith. These are these are examples. But sometimes people fall in the trap of self-justification and double standard. One one of the uh, good example is what I read many years ago in uh, a novel written by the famous American Jewish writer Elie Wiesel. His, his novel, Dawn. And uh, he's, he's saying, you know, or he made one of the characters of this story, one of, one of the Israeli soldiers, saying, the commandment, thou shalt not kill, was given from the summit of one of the mountains here in Palestine. And we were the only ones to obey it. But that's all over. In the days and weeks and months to come, we will have only one purpose, to kill those who have made us kill us. So this is self-justification. Self-justification is one thing to do when we talk about universal morality. Uh, so basically saying, well, we've been killed for a thousand years, we didn't fight back. We are the only one who respect that command that, you know, the first, the Ten Commandments in the Torah. Uh, of course, uh, he clearly didn't read the book of Joshua. <laughs> if he read the book of Joshua, he would that. And judges. Yeah, of course. They did not respect it all the time. Uh, nor did Muslim respect it all the time, nor did Christian respect it all the time. So, no need to make yourself or your people innocent uh, and just victims. Worse than this is that let's kill those who make us killers. So even when you are killer, you're still a victim. Tony Jordan, one of the uh, uh, Jewish intellectuals, professor, he was professor, he died two years ago. He was professor at the University of uh, New York, New York University, professor of European modern history. He said that. The problem of Israelis is they want to be heroes and victims at the same time. You cannot be a hero and a victim at the same time. So, so whether you are a victim or you are a hero, you want to fight hard, you are fighting, but don't, don't claim to be a pacifist while you are fighting, or to be a victim while you are uh, killing other innocent uh, people. So my question to uh, Elie Wiesel, Elie Wiesel is a great writer, by the way, and he has Nobel Prize. <laughs> But I just have a problem with his moral vision. I, I, I really love his, his writing, and aesthetically it's extraordinary, beautiful writing, especially uh, his, his novel, Night. About the, he, he, was, uh, he was one of the survivors of the Holocaust. And he's uh, describing uh, the life in the, in the con concentration camp with his father. Uh, Night is a very moving novel. Extraordinary, beautiful one. But I don't like his novel, Dawn, because he moved from victim to self justifying uh, hero. So my question is you know, what kind of moral claim does Wiesel, who was born a Romanian father, Hungarian mother, uh, what kind of moral claim does he have over the divine call at Mount Sinai in the heart of the Middle Eastern desert? So, that divine call is not for him or for me or for anybody. This is a universal. And if, if there are people who have to claim that, that 
or appropriated one code, well, there are human beings living in that region for thousand years. Uh, but the most important question is, by which moral or legal norm are Palestinians of today responsible for the wrongdoings of the Germans of yesterday? So he want Palestinians of today to pay for the wrongdoing of Germans of yesterday. So there is no consistency here for any kind of universalism. Anyway, again, this is not a Jewish problem or American problem. This is a problem in human culture, human morality. And we have our own problem in this. Let's be honest about it. We have problems in Islam jurisprudence. Let's read this nice text of Imam Al-Haram Ibn Jawain, and those of you who read Man alumuhu qat'an. أن النسوة لا مدخل لهن في تخير الإمام وعقد الإمامة. آه سوري. إمام الحرمين الجواني سيد في his famous book الغيادي one of the classical texts of Islam political jurisprudence. He say. ما نعلمه قطعا أن النساء لا مدخل لهن في تخير الإمام لا أفنس ما سسر وعقد الإمامة وكذلك لا يناط هذا الأمر بالعبيد وإن حاجوا قصب السرق في العلوم ولا تعلق له بالعوام الذين لا يعدون من العلماء ولو الأحلام ولا مدخل لأهل الذمة لنصب الأئمة He's talking here about people who, but in, in our language today, people who have the right to vote. People who are seen in electing or selecting the leader of the community. He said, number one, woman has no say in this. Definitely. Number two, slaves, even if they are the most knowledgeable human beings, have no say in this. Even if they are the most knowledgeable human beings, they have no, no right to, to participate in this. Number three, and the awam, the awam, yani, the masses have no right at all in this. And number four, and the dhimma, people of the book, living within Muslim community, have no right also, no say in this. Okay, tell me, what do we have? What is <laughs> here? Who is left? Who is left to vote or to elect or to select leader of, of, of the community? Maybe uh, a few military leaders and tribal leaders. So, uh, th that's all right. Uh, male, of course, has to be male. Has to be very influential. They have to be Muslims, etc. This is the problem of borders of moral community. Imam al Hadamat is doing is making these borders very tight. Uh, okay, we have other problems. Example in, in Islamic jurisprudence. Equality between Muslims and non-Muslims in the murder punishment. The majority of Muslim scholars said if a non-Muslim killed a Muslim, he cannot be killed. Even if he killed him deliberately. No. He just pay blood money, they pay deep. Three of the four men said no. He cannot be killed. Non Muslim a Muslim cannot be killed for uh not even if he kills him deliberately. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa is the one who said no, he has to be killed. I mean, there is no distinction between human beings in in the punishment for murder. Because Allah so you said, nafsu be nafs, sword for sword. Uh, and there are many other verses in the Quran. Uh, why the majority of scholars said this? Because they, they took a part of Hadith of Prophet a part of Hadith, and they didn't take the whole text. The Prophet said in Hadith, uh, لا يقتل مسلم بكافر ولا ذو عهد في عهده. لا يقتل مسلم بكافر ولا ذو عهد في عهده. المسلم 
should not be killed for a uh, non-Muslim and a non-Muslim who, who has covenant with Muslims should not also be killed for a non-Muslim who, who, who doesn't. What, what Prophet Salaam means is that the issue here is not about difference of belief. It's about people who are at war with Muslims and people who are not at war with Muslims. And this is how Imam Tahawi uh, interpret hadith because he, he brought, he collected the different version of the hadith and put it within the context. Prophet Sallallahu is talking about people who are at war with Muslims. If you murder one of those Qurayshis who are fighting Muslims, declaring war on Muslims, no, you won't be punished uh, by capital punishment because there is at least shubha or there is doubt about, you know, because you're, fight, you're, you're killing basically a soldier of the enemy. Even if you kill a soldier of the enemy, time, time is not time, the moment of fighting, but still there is a reason behind that, at least you want to be killed for it. And this is true also for a non-Muslim who has covenant Muslim or the same, he cannot be killed if he, for example, if one of the people of the book killed one of the Qurayshis, pagan Qurayshis who were fighting Muslims at the time, he cannot be killed for that because people are at war. So uh, the problem is that hadith was taken out of context and they took only part of it because, because Bukhari said only part of it. But the full hadith is narrated by other narrators of the hadith and it has to be taken as one text. Anyway, this is just an example. Uh, equality between Muslims and non-Muslims in political rights also is one of the big challenges that we still have today. I mean, many Arab countries today have clause in their constitution that president the country has to be Muslim, for example. Uh, well, Quran didn't say that that president, head of Muslim state or Muslim majority state has to be Muslim. Hadith didn't say that. Now, Hadith and Quran said that Muslim majority country need to be ruled based on Islamic principles. But rule based on Islamic principle is not equivalent of the, a Muslim president. Just like if you have a Muslim president of uh, US or any other country, uh, well, he will, he will rule a country based on the constitution, not based on his personal belief. So, if, if this opinion is understandable in the past, which I have no problem or an objection of, I have no objection about it in the past, but today it has no place because countries are ruled based on their constitutions, regardless of the personal belief of the head of state. Exactly like a judge. In the past, of course, Muslims, they want the judge to be only a Muslim. Why? Because a judge was mujtahid. He was studying Islam jurisprudence, he was giving his opinion based on Quran and Sunnah, etc. He was not just following article number one or article number two of the law. But today is different. The judge today has no legislative authority at all. The judge in the past is combining legislative role with an executive role. Today, no. If you have Islamic law, it doesn't matter what, what kind of faith the judge has because he has to justify his ruling based on the text of that law. So based on article number 10 of the penal law of Tunisia or Morocco or Egypt or Syria, this is the judgment. So uh, th there, is a, there is a big difference between the context of the past and the context of today. and. The, the tight borders of moral community that you have in the past have no place in today's uh, state. If we want to have states based on Islamic principles, Islamic universal principles. There are many other examples in, uh, from Ibn al-Qayyim, uh, uh, book, you know, Hakam uh, al But uh, I want to just to conclude with the Hadith of Prophet 
Salman radiyallahu anhu told Abu Darja radiyallahu anhu these are two companions of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you owe duty to your creator you owe duty to your body you owe duty to your family so you should give to everyone his due Abu Darda came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he reported the whole story and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Salman is right so from Islamic perspective the borders of the moral community are universal borders but there are priorities of course there are priorities i cannot say that the responsibility towards your family is the same as responsibility towards your neighbor or your neighbor as same as someone from another country no there are priority but those priorities should be based on universal principles not double standard yes you can prioritize without using double standard جزاكم الله خيرا وشكر الله لكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so how much time for discussion ما شاء الله 30 minutes for discussion go ahead please floor is yours yeah No, because um, I think that if we go back to that discussion, it would be a nice way to um, conclude all of this information because it's very interesting. Jazakallah khair. Thanks so much. We're back to the questions. So who want to... Now, after we have this discussion of different moral doctrines and my view of the Islamic perspective on these, so what do you think now about these questions? What are you going to do with the earthquake victims in your living room now? <laughs> huh? did, you change, uh, did you change your mind about uh, your guest in the living room? Or? Yeah. Dr. It's not related to the three questions, but it's related to your understanding of Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yes, shukran. Um, uh, my question is related to your understanding of the word universal and universalism, because nowadays when we talk about universalism, uh, we refer to a certain understanding, especially if we are talking about universal human rights, paradigm, and all this uh, controversy uh, around uh, the fact that this um, coming from the West, and it is trying to impose certain understanding, certain meanings on the other parts of the world. So, and again, it is also used with double standard. So sometimes it is human rights, but uh, it yes, is it used differently yeah. according to the different work uh, on which it is applied. Yeah, that's a very good question and take us back to that uh, what I said that the Islamic moral system is a combination of categoricalism and contractualism means there are some basic human rights that should be no difference between all the human beings about it a human being should not be killed for example without reason should not be jailed without reason this is regardless of culture if, if we take relativism, you know, well, there were some cultures that, that provide you know, uh, human sacrifice in their religious right, for example. So why not just respect their culture? It's their culture. So we cannot, no. If respect other people's culture means violating the basic humanity of a human being, no. But after those basic principles, then we accept diversity. So there might be diverse, there, there must be respect for diverse, but that do, and, and that's the contractualist aspect of morality. Uh, uh, but, uh, di but diversity, uh, first we have to have commonality, we have to recognize commonality first, and then respect diversity. Some Muslims are too defensive 
and uh, there, there too much defense, defensiveness for diversity, you know, made them even, they don't want to recognize commonality on universal principles of, of uh, human rights. And I think that's problem. I think we need to have both commonality and diversity. Shukra. Uh, thank you very much for this good presentation. And uh, um, I just want to uh, add something and ask a question as well. Because if I, uh, if I ask you and ask everyone here, if you see that someone is uh, drowning in a, a deep sea or in a, in a swimming pool and asking for help, what is your first reaction? Are you going to ask this person if he's a Muslim or if he's a Jew or a Christian and then save him? Or you save the person? Well, of course, you don't need to ask and you should not ask. But this is not the, 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 the challenges we have here. The challenges we have here, if you have a clash between two responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if someone is asking you for help, or, let's see, you are, uh, you are a medical doctor on the front line in, in war. There are many people who are wounded. And you have, to, you have to prioritize, of course. You cannot treat all of them. You have thousands of people who are asking for help. All of them are bleeding. <coughs> so you have so, to prioritize. I, I mean, what, this is the question we ask in, uh, in what we call intercultural education to mm -hmm. its children in school. Mm -hmm. We try to taught, teach children morality and ethics and more, uh, moral values. So we ask them these questions. What is your first reaction when a person is asking for help? Mm -hmm. And then the students or the pupils ask, I will help that person. They don't think that, oh, he's a black man, I will not help him, or he's a white man, I would help him. So the first reaction, then we have to go back to the human morality from what we say, fitra, what we have mm -hmm. been talking before, in fitra and how we are in human beings. And then this is not normative because we have something which maybe you haven't discussed, which is racism and discrimination. Because there, is, uh, there are Muslims who are helping only Muslims, there are Christians who are only helping mostly Christians, and we have Muslims in the West, they just uh, have their own activities and they are not involved in the whole majority of the community. When they do activities, they do them to, to themselves. And, and that is what we have as a problem today. How can we try to get out from uh, just helping the same skin, the same religion, to helping everyone? And that is what universal uh, uh, moral and values. I think uh, we have to problematize it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. I mean, uh, but I, I think most of the human beings are decent, of course, and they would help someone who needs help, unless there are some other detraction. Uh, detraction here means someone that has priority on his For example, two people are uh, dying in this swimming pool, or two kids, one of them is a Muslim, one is not, one is white and one is black, one. so which one are you going to pick first? So the problem is when it's clash when, when there is clash but in general i think uh, in, in islam culture specifically and uh, uh, it's it's very important for us in this universal time and the time of globalization as muslims to universalize really our our norm not only to ask others to universalize their norm uh, uh, i think one of the problems is the interpretation sometimes common interpretation of the text that is not based on explicit text for example let me give another example uh, you have debate between muslim scholars should zakat give be given only to muslims or given to anyone in need okay quran never said that it has to be given only to muslims hadith never said that it has to be only to muslims no إنما الصدقات للفقراء والمساكين زكاة أو الصدقات is for those are poor those are regardless okay ويطعمون الطعام على حبه مسكينا ويتيما وإسيرا الله عز وجل is asking us to feed people who are in need those who are poor those who are you know prisoners etc didn't say if they are Muslim or not but Muslim scholars saying زكاة is given many Muslim scholars saying زكاة is given only to Muslims 
So we have problem with some uh, interpretation color with culture of the time, but it has no explicit basis in the text itself. So we need to free the text from this kind of interpretation. This is what Malik ben rahmatullahi called Tajreed al-ayat al-Qur'aniyya min al-ghawashi al-fiqhiyya wa al-tarikhiyya wa al-kalamiyya means to free the Qur'anic verse from these historical and theological and basically interpretive covers that, that is becoming, you know, curtain between us and the, the text. Yes. Hey. Oh, talk to him. Thank you, for the talk. Uh, in the same spirit, what would be your understanding of the verse? Or instance, so uh, if you, if a tribe um, if some Muslims ask for your support, so uh, support them unless it's against another tribe that you're in contract with. So here we have. Um, uh, contractualism, mm -hmm. is it, is it? Um, that puts uh, contracts uh, before the divine of faith. So, would be your, um, your yeah, that's a very good example of uh, of uh, this clash between values or at Dr. Tarko Sulam Sulam Qiyam. You have a, a priority of values here. Well, uh, in the time when this verse was revealed, in the time of Prophet وسلم, some Muslims were um, um, they are attached to the Muslim community in by both faith and nationality. You can say, if we have to use nationality here, because they are Muslims and they live within the Muslim state, which is Medina. They made Hijrah to Medina. And you have another category, those who are attached to the community by the faith, but not, not, not by politics, because they didn't join the community in a time when you, it was a must to join the community, to move to Medina. And you have those who are not Muslims. And those who are not Muslims are also two categories, those you have contract with or, or, or a treaty, peace treaty, and those you don't. So Quran is giving different Category, categorization of, of this and different perspective. Uh, a Muslim who is living in Medina at the time is both a Muslim and a citizen, you can say. So he has, you are binded uh, with him with these two, uh, uh, two things. Uh, a Muslim who is not, yeah, he has a right as a Muslim, but he has, he has no political right on you. And this is when this verse is, is revealed, that yes, help them if you can, but if helping them is against people with whom you have treaty, no, you don't need to help them. Because like, like today, for example, you want to help Muslims, but uh, it, there is difference between helping Muslims from your country, because you have implicitly two contract with them, the contract of the faith and the contract of the country and helping Muslims from a far away uh, country. So the responsibility is not the same. There is a level of, of, uh, of, of responsibility here. Yes, who's next, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Shuk? Sorry, I, I just regarding this question. Yes. I mean, okay, if I try to answer them, if you want, but for me, for the three one, even the third one, it was, it's, not, it's not really, uh, a scenario because it happened. The two first is just a scenario. So if you really want uh, sincere, uh, re, I mean answers, or uh, what do you mean by scenario? I mean this is a scenario. They cannot happen. They it can, can happen. Ha they life. can happen, but yes. no one did that. But um, I want to answer the last one. No, we don't know. Maybe maybe it happened. Maybe someone did yeah, this. Yeah, but I did. I, maybe. In this case, we will have a real. If answer. you have a, a small town in some of those country, a it's firefighter. Good. Fire in the school, he ran away to the school, and then uh, he finds his, his kids are there. So. It's good, then we will have a real answer. Okay. Okay, 
can answer the, 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 the second one. Uh, the third one, sorry, I have been victim of earthquake. Mm -hmm. I didn't take anyone home and no one took me home. So this is clear. <laughs> so, so Alhamdulillah, the question is not to you, to somebody else. It's, it's nice to me because, you know, do we, not, do we want assumption or we want really to know what we, how people will react in this kind of situation? The fourth one, the fourth one, I think uh, everywhere there is victim of civil wars. You can ask people who took someone home with him, <laughs> and you will have mm. the answer. Well, no, I'm not asking just people who live this in life, but I'm asking question that everybody can face. It's not imaginary. It's something that might happen to any one of us. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the whole problem in the theory is just when you have clash between moral responsibilities, what to do, what kind of borders, what are your priority, uh, that's, that's a big challenge. And it's, it's a moral challenge each one of us can face. Maybe we are facing it in different ways today in our daily life. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, I love the idea of universal Islamic ethics and principles. My question is, firstly, what is the Ummah in relation to this. And secondly, there are some hadith and verses and things like that that seem like they're pointing out universal principles, but the language doesn't seem so. So, uh, the Muslim is the one from whom other Muslims are saved from the hand and tuck. So what non-Muslims are, right? Or, uh, wish for your brother what you wish for yourself. So, the language implies not women, not non-Muslims. So no, not necessarily. Uh, uh, I, I know, I mean, Imam Nawawi says it. If you have a brother and I tell you, man, take care of your brother, it doesn't mean don't take care of anybody else. No, that's, that's, that's not implied. <coughs> okay. But this is called mafhum al-mukhalafa in, in Arabic rhetoric, and uh, uh, it doesn't apply all the time. It depends on the context of the time. You, you, it's, you have a younger brother, I tell you, man, you need to take care of your younger brother. He has exam next week, for example. Does that mean that don't worry about anybody else? No, it has nothing to do with others. And it doesn't mean worry about everyone. Yeah, you know, worry about others is another text. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, okay. that's it. <laughs> worry about others, another. I'm telling you worry about everybody in this case, and I'm telling you in this case, worry about your brother. Yes, that's, that's, that's the issue. But uh, uh, the, the, the question is very important because uh, you know, we have, multiple, we have multiple identities. And multiple identities, if we translate them morally, means multiple moral responsibilities. As a citizen of this country, you have moral responsibility. It's based on contractualism. Because, you know, we have shared in this building, each one has part of it. That's what citizenship is about. So, of course, we have common responsibility to maintain this building, too. And we have also common benefits. As a, a Muslim, you have also a responsibility toward those who, who, with whom you have this common faith. And as a human being, you have also responsibility. So uh, if we look at moral, different moral responsibility in, a, in a, like the way we look at multiple identities, you don't have to make them uh, you know, uh, negating each other. No. The issue is how to give each one it's due. Ati kulladi haqqin haqqa is the hadith. How to do the right, uh, prioritizing, but without using double standard. The problem is double standard. Priorita pri prioritization is, is, uh, is, is something that everybody has to do in his life. Everybody has to do that. But don't use double standard in this. I mean, you care more about your family, but that should not mean you are hurting your neighbor, mm -hmm. or you don't care about them. So uh, that's, that's the challenge. Sheikh uh, Shaukh Thank you very much for the nice, beautiful talk. Um, I have one question about uh, contractualism. Um, and I think you said um, that contractualism should be something that is guided by something that's higher than only the contract between, between human beings, because this can, um, this can be uh, misused. And you give the, a nice example that if 99% voted for killing 1% of the population, that 
this contra kind of controversialism is, is not valid, so we need something higher. Yes. But I think, I think that if we look, if you go back to the Quran, I think that the nature of contractualism uh, is defined differently and will automatically avoid this kind of situation. We find the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ So here the contractualism, this shura, is in this verse pre preceded pre precedent preceded preceded by by conditions mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. those who responded to the call of their Lord who and they they established prayer. established prayer so here so it means the shura will be out of a community who replied, so a fitra community who replied to the call of Allah and who performed salah. So actually this kind of contractualism is based on, on fitra. And I think this, is, this has to be looked at in, in its whole. We can't say that contractualism is, in Islam is just contract between people. No, there is <coughs> other conditions. So you can't take into account the contractualism without these other conditions that's coming uh, before this contractualism. So it means it's example of 99% deciding to killing 1% is impossible according to this, to this Islamic concept of contractualism because it can, it can be only based on uh, fitra and, and, and this al-ma'roof here and this essential also in Islam is what, what is known. So the, this contractualism, this, this, this agreement among people will be based on ma'roof. What they know or think being the good, but what their fitra also, what is known by the fitra of being the good, and what is known by revelation of being the good. So don't you think that here we are talking about a different type in Islam of contractualism? Um, I, I think that's, that's a great connection. Um, that's why I said that Islam is a combination of categoricalism and contractualism. I mean, you have to have solid moral ground based on stable principles that cannot be violated regardless of people's wish and will. That's, and, and that's what probably uh, Sheikh Shawqi is drawing from the verse, you know, when, they, when, they, when they respond to the call of their Lord, then their mutual consultation would give fruit based on a solid uh, ground. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I agree 100%, and uh, I think uh, contractualism, if, if it's not based on stable uh, moral uh, principle, it will, it will lead us to relativism. It's some sort of relativism and trivializing the human life itself. Because after all, if people wish to uh, kill one of them, they will vote and do it. So, no, they, they, they must be some higher uh, reference. This high reference in Islamic culture is the will of Allah Azza wa Jalla. In uh, in the in the modern or pre-modern Western culture, you have the concept of natural law. Uh, of course, there are also some religious people in the West who who believe in the divine command theory that it's not natural law; it's divine law. Where do we draw this stable and unchangeable principle that cannot be violated by the will of people? Cannot mean should not, must not be violated morally. But of course, sometimes they, they are violated. But it's wrong to violate, even if people want to violate them. Where do we draw this? Is it from natural law, as Kant said, and some uh, European philosophers in the Renaissance time? Or is the source of this is the creator himself? Uh, you know, it depends on how people, are people believers or not believers in this and, and the place of religion in public life. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> since, since you have the mic, you know, um, I don't know if this is morally <laughs> sound or not, but practically, yes. Go ahead. But I was waiting before. Khalas. Okay, that's a moral reason. So, your, your example on case is very useful to understand well uh, the different approach or moral approach. And uh, I would like to go to uh, the list of uh, relativism, subjectivism, and so on. And I will try to apply uh, your, your judgment. Uh, yeah. 
what I observe is that the Muslim spirit, the, Muslims, um, the Muslim mind, is affect, affected by these uh, major approach, which are epistemological and moral approach. For example, when you said uh, you, you evoked the hadith of Rasulullah who said, "Istifti um, qalb." Uh, here is uh, the intelligence. So consult, we say like this. Consult. Your, are, your are you sure qalb here is the intelligence? <laughs> Well, if you agree with Kant, yes, qalb here is reason. Let but me, let if me you go agree on. with Rousseau or some other... <laughs> let me go on. You are, you are yes, uh, go going to see what I want to, to, to mean. Um, so, most of Muslims think uh, like this. I, I am going to uh, consult my heart. And then, in this situation, I would have the response to know who I am going to save. My son or other, uh, and etc. But... What is in the heart? In my heart, there's relativism. All people here are the same. So I could take this one, or this one, or this one. There's no rule. You can't judge which one of them I have to take first. This is relativism applied in, in this case. Subjectivism is, I love this child, and I hate this person and this family, who, who is going to, to die today. So it's according to my feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, utilitarianism, contractualism, and contractualism, to, to come back to your remark, uh, it could be here, nationalism. I am going to save only Algerians because I'm Algerian, and I have a specific feeling toward people. And not feeling, you have contract with them. Yes, contract. But in in terms of resources, for yes, example. Yes, but... Translated financial resources of the country. It's a category of uh, judgment translated into a feeling. Contractualism is not only a, a category, it's only it, it uh, became a feeling, a way of evaluating, uh, choosing, selecting, and rejecting, uh, so, and so on. But what is the... Um, uh, I will speak about uh, the Tawhidi, uh, Mizen. Mm -hmm. Every person ha has a mizan, mm -hmm. uh, relativist, subjectivist, and so on. A tawhidi mizan, as a tool of uh, evaluation, uh, if I speak with uh, Al Farouqi's uh, thought basis, uh, it's, it has uh, two or three uh, methodolog methodological principles, which are the unity of God which implies the unity of two, which implies the unity of man. <coughs> and the oneness then, of God. And, yes. Yeah. The oneness of God and ah, the unity oneness. of humanity. Ah, sorry. And then the unity of good. Mm -hmm. uh, based on these principles, I can have the right judgment in this case and in every ordinary uh, moral situation. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah that's uh, very good. I, I agree, of course, uh, Dr. Barouki, he, he was a great man in theorizing these, these, these issues in his uh, PhD dissertation, Justifying the Good, and uh, in his book on Tawheed, of course, and others. Uh, and uh, I agree with him 100% in terms of universalizing Islam principles or, or showing that they are universal based on the one connection between oneness of God and unity of humanity. But uh, uh, but when you come to practical ethics, there is difference between theoretical ethics and practical ethics. So it's very easy in theoretical ethics to say, I believe in universal principles. Uh, but when you come to practical ethics, that means case studies dealing with day-to-day -day, uh, challenges, prioritizing, uh, like, as I said, a doctor who is battlefield, thousand people wounded. So he will see, he has to use in his mind some criteria. What can I achieve? Who can be saved first? How many people I can save? Who is, there is hope to save and there is cases there is no hope or very little chance to, to save life, etc. You know, this kind of practical that come to your mind quickly, reflect your uh, professional skills, but also your moral views. And, and that's what we're, we're talking about today. We're done.
Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm happy to see you again. And uh, any one of you who want this slide, you can have them, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair.